What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Rewired Soul podcast. It's your host, Chris Boutte, and we have an amazing episode for you today. I know I say this all the time, and I think they are. I only bring on interesting authors. But anyways, today the author is Megan Dom, and she she is one of my favorites. But before I discuss this episode and the topics that we dive into, make sure, make sure if you haven't yet, you've checked out the previous two episodes. So first, we talked to Robin Hansen, all right? We really set the foundation for social signaling, our, our hidden motives, why we do what we do. Then yesterday, we talked with moral philosopher Justin Tosi about his book, Grandstanding, all right? We talked about moral grandstanding, why we do this, why we feel it's so important to signal, you know, what our morals are and what tribe we're in and all these other things, which which can lead to a lot of unhealthy conflict because we're putting people down just to raise ourselves up and show people that we are just the pinnacle of, of morality, right? Well, today... To round out this topic, we're talking with Megan Dom. So check it out. I, no introduction I can do can do Megan Dom justice. And and maybe it's because I'm a writer. I don't know. But if you're a writer, like you need to check out her books. Like I I read her books, and even in my last review of one of her books, I said, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna start calling her Megan Dam because her writing is so good. I don't know what it is because I usually don't even like books like collections of essays and things like that. But she is a very skilled writer. She's been writing for years and we talked today just kind of about uh you know the culture wars which is what her new book is about um her book did come out a year or two ago it's called the problem with everything but um as you all know when i was trying to figure out what the hell is going on in the world and why everybody is yelling and fighting and arguing and you know uh mob mentality and just attacking people and canceling people and dogpiling. I, I tried to learn as much as I could about it and I came across Megan's book and I, I read it and then I recently read it again in about a day or two. And um, it, it's really good. So today I, I had the opportunity to talk with Megan about some of the, the topics from the book. We talk about how, you know, feminism has changed over the years. We talk about, you know, uh, racism. We talk about being a liberal when, you know, you're trying to have more nuanced conversations. And as you saw from the title of this episode, we we try to have some nuanced talks and and discuss free speech and all of that. But but yeah, it it all kind of comes together with what we've been talking about this week when it comes to signaling and and just trying to have healthy conversations with other people because I truly believe that that is one of the most important things just so we can all you know try to make this world a little bit better place because nothing absolutely nothing will happen if we don't talk to one another and nuance is so dang important it's nuts and you're going to hear about uh Megan's uh, merch that she recently came out with that that is called nuance as Fuck. All right. So anyways, anyways, uh, before we get started, make sure you check down in the description below. Not only will I be linking uh, Megan's social media, her podcast, as well as some of her amazing books, but make sure you're following me on social media at The Rewired Soul over on Instagram and Twitter. I've been uploading the episodes to YouTube as well. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube right now, as you'll see, there is video. I've been doing more video recordings with authors. So yeah, make sure you're following me on social media. I have so many cool things coming up, so many cool announcements. Um, I also give little previews for authors who are coming up as well. And that's kind of cool. I think it's kind of cool because I let you know like a week or two in advance who's coming on. So if it seems interesting, you could read their book and then you get to listen to us talk about it and dive into all sorts of interesting subjects, but you'll already know what it's about because you read the book, all right? And you get to have some of your questions answered. But anyways, anyways, it's such a great conversation that I had with Megan. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Megan Dom about her book, The Problem With Everything. Good morning, Megan. Thanks for coming on the podcast. How are you doing today? 
Hi, Chris. I'm well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I Yeah, so I have you here. I want to talk about not only your book, uh, The Problem With Everything, but just, yeah, also the, the problems with, <laughs> with everything. So, yeah, as you know, it was my second read through of the book. And, uh, and something I wanted to discuss today, um, aside from like, just why you wrote the book was I was really thinking of, you know, I'm liberal, you seem pretty liberal as well, but it seems difficult to have a lot of conversations around this. So was that uh, like a lot of the nuanced conversations? So was that one of the motivations for the book or what, what drove you to write it with these changes that we're seeing? Yeah, well, um, it's the sixth book I've published. I've been writing essays and thinking about the culture and just kind of trying to mine the, the social landscape through my own kind of lens for the better part of 30 years, really. Mm -hmm. I started publishing seriously probably about 25 years ago. And, you know, the job as I saw it at that time as, as a social observer, as a journalist, as a as an opinion haver, as a columnist, whatever, was to ask the questions that a lot of people wanted to ask, but were either afraid to ask or unable to articulate, mm -hmm. just kind of speak honestly and thoughtfully and carefully and precisely about things that were going on in the world. And I loved that job, that I was good at it. It felt yeah. right. It was a really rich and interesting and engaging social and professional sphere to inhabit mm -hmm. and somewhere along the way it, the rules started changing and i noticed that a lot of the people with whom i'd been on the same page sort mm. of you know, generally politically ideologically um were suddenly kind of kind of reciting talking points that felt like platitudes it didn't feel they didn't feel honest they mm -hmm. felt like they were just kind of reciting this party line that had that had arisen, and uh, I was I was wondering why that was. And mm -hmm. I started noticing this well before the Trump era, mind mm -hmm. you. I started yeah. noticing this around 2014, 2015, especially in the context of women's issues. A lot of the way mm -hmm. feminism was being discussed on social media felt very reductive and. Um, just very like just cutesy and um, and just not uh, of any substance. And so yeah, I started yeah. wondering then. So yeah, to answer your question, I wrote the book because I really felt that I had to write the book. Um, I wanted to kind of get at this mm -hmm. and it started off just being about this conversation around feminism. And um, over time, these sorts of rhetorical kind of uh, kind of moves started mm -hmm. to morph out into lots of different topics in the culture. So the book became this kind of monster that I couldn't yeah. contain. A pretty short book, but it took a, an embarrassingly long amount of time to uh, figure yeah. out. Yeah, and just rereading it, I, I, I was reminded of all the different topics you cover and I'm just sitting there like like nodding along and and if we could just sit on the the topic of feminine uh feminism for a second so obviously I'm a dude um but I remember uh one of my best friends she was a roommate for a while and I remember her struggling because um she's a feminist and she was gonna get uh she was uh, like planning on going to an event or something like that. But prior to she posted about kind of some observations you make in the book, which she's like, it seems like feminism is changing and it's not what it used to be. And there's, you know, all these different things. And, and it made her not want to really be a part of anymore. And just her talking about that got her attacked on Facebook by her local friends and stuff like that. So like, can you, can you kind of, I don't know, can you kind of see like what you have observe from like the change of like, I, I think you call it like fourth wave fem feminism. Like how, how have you seen it change? And obviously it's nuanced, right? Cause there's still feminists like yourself, but yeah. there's kind of like the new wave as well. So how's, how's it kind of morphed and what's going on? Feminism has always changed, of course. So mm -hmm. it, this is not like, I don't think we, I, I'm not necessarily complaining about uh, cultural shifts, everything evolves, obviously. So when we talk about the waves of feminism, the first wave of feminism would be like the suffragettes around mm -hmm. the, the, the turn of the, the you know, the, the, the late the late 19th into 20th century. Sorry, late, where are we? What century are we in? Late <laughs> 21st, 1900s, yeah. <laughs> late 1800s yeah. into, uh, into the 
into uh, the turn of the century. You know what I mean. The, I know what you mean. Kids, fighting for <laughs> women, women to vote. That's pretty. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, and then we had the second wave, which is uh, the the late '60s into the '70s, Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan era, and a lot of that was about things like reproductive freedoms, mm -hmm. workplace equality, that kind of stuff. And again, that's very tangible. Um, and there were certainly aesthetic components to that movement that maybe rubbed some people the wrong way. I mean, I was never, um, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of stereotypes around what a feminist is mm -hmm. that came out of second wave feminism, uh, the hairy armpits and the, you know, just general Bra burning and stuff like that. Yeah. And bra burning actually never occurred. It's funny. There was really? like, yeah, if you look, there's very, there's like no documentation of it at all it's one of those memes that sort of arose that's, that's a false, interesting false narrative although um i did have an interaction with a woman who um was is now in probably in her 60s and she swears that she and her friends had burned their bras so <laughs> it's not like it never happened but it was certainly it was not this like mass movement like yeah i'm sure somebody thing. somewhere burned a bra at some yes, point yes. <laughs> no, no doubt um so that's the second wave and then the, there was a third wave that kind of emerged in the in the early 90s. And a lot of that had to do with like um, being aware of things like date rape. That was a totally new concept mm -hmm. at that time. The idea that you could be raped by somebody you knew, uh, that wasn't something that had been discussed. So mm -hmm. we started to see the Take Back the Night marches on college campuses, um, a lot of talk about rape and you know sexual assault on college campuses. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was that movement, and then um, yeah, around as we got into the two thousands, uh, a lot of this obviously came online, and mm -hmm. so there was this whole culture of online feminism that, to me, to my Gen X mind and ears, mm -hmm. seemed to be very much about memes and slogans, and mm. and that came this thing where you were like making fun of men all the time and sort of being mean to men and complaining about about them and this mm -hmm. notion of toxic masculinity emerged and this idea that um that you know that men were constantly taking up too much space and interrupting women and mm -hmm. mansplaining and man spreading and all this like stuff. the buzzfeed and, era yeah and yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, it was it was ironic in a lot of ways like this idea of male tears like you know mm -hmm. i drink male tears for breakfast like that arose because jessica valenti is a very prominent um feminist and writer mm -hmm. in this sphere she would get into arguments with men's rights activists all the time as yeah. one does if, if you say provocative things on on the internet and so they would be horrible to her and then she would she kind of thought back and said you know oh your your male tears are so silly that i drink them for breakfast and i mean yeah. it was kind of clearly ironic in the beginning they would talk mm -hmm. about ironic misandry but i found it the irony i saw was that it was effectively doing the opposite of what i mm. think they wanted to do it, it was centering men in a way that was completely counterproductive to any kind of like feminist project like this idea that it was okay mm -hmm. to make fun of men and be mean to them that comes from an assumption that men automatically have more power than you and yeah. that's the real flaw there yeah. so that was something i started to write about at that time yeah it's it's so it's it's so interesting too um because something you you touch on in the book is like going through the the data and the statistics and it's this weird it's this weird thing so uh yeah brief history of chris i'm a recovering drug addict i was in a ton of toxic relationships had an alcoholic mom so i found the wrong women all that stuff but yeah like you mentioned like uh you know domestic abuse like you know occurring where like the woman you know hits the man or you know even in uh, uh lesbian relationships and all that stuff and that's kind of like not getting as much attention and i look back at it and uh, when i was doing a bunch of mental health content on my youtube channel like because i'm trying to get men to be able to talk about this stuff like hey it happens too and you know all these other things but but yeah anyway like even just having that conversation with you right now i'm like oh god people are going to think i'm like trying to have this like pity party and like you mentioned like the men's rights activists like like why why do you think that is that it's it's difficult to talk about just it happening to both and you know like hey it's it's more nuanced <laughs> than yeah. that 
Well, I think it took a long time for feminists to get to the point where it was it was acceptable to talk about domestic abuse in marriages and relationships. I mean, there used to be no penalty for for beating your wife. Oh, yeah. It used to be inconceivable that you could rape your wife, for instance. So those were important those were important recognitions. And so I don't want to underplay that, but you know, there's mm -hmm. always this like overreach that happens. There's this concept creep. So I think there was so much work done around issues of domestic violence and protecting women that we sort of forgot that it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously by definition, men on balance are physically stronger than women. They have more physical power in any given dynamic men are going to be at an advantage physically uh -huh. uh, almost all the time. However, you know, the statistics do show that, for, I, for instance, I think the highest, um, the highest rate of domestic violence happens in lesbian relationships. Uh -huh. um, so the idea that women are somehow incapable of being destructive emotionally or otherwise is frankly to me sexist. Yeah. And so, so yeah, to answer your question, why this doesn't get talked about, I think that I think that a lot of men's rights activists, and I do think they have a point. I'm actually really interested in the men's rights movement because I think it's saying a lot of interesting things and bringing up a lot of important issues. Just unfortunately, a lot of the the major players don't do a mm -hmm. very good job, like PR wise. They they don't do the <laughs> right. favors, and so it's really hard to even kind of mention them without getting tarred as some kind of like apologist mm -hmm. for like a, a, a handful of jerks that kind of yeah. define them. But, but um, yeah, I, I think that I think that there's a fear of being associated with that crowd. But I also think that men don't speak up about these kinds mm -hmm. of abuses it's it's there's a lot of shame around it it's become not only socially acceptable but there's a kind of political currency in women talking about mm -hmm. their victimization but for men to be able to do it it's still we still haven't gotten there um, yeah. i think it's i think that's that's a lot of it yeah, it, it's interesting because one of the reasons I, you know, I, I started out with my platform being like, you know, mental health and addiction recovery and things like that is because, uh, you know, I, I just turned 36. And so I'm, I'm you know, like I'm the far end of millennial, like one of the first millennial, the early stage stuff. But we didn't talk about, you know, uh, uh, you know, mental health, emotions, feelings, all that kind of stuff. And I was bottling everything up, which led to my drug addiction, which almost killed me, which almost took my son's father away. So now I'm very like, hey, we need to talk talk about this stuff you know uh you touch on in the book like sometimes the mental health conversation goes way too far like like oh I had a bad day so I'm depressed or you know oh I'm traumatized by this like minor event and stuff like that but there's this balance and and yeah I'm trying to get people to just have these conversations and kind of normalize it like hey people men can deal with this stuff too and then there's the whole conversation of like what it means to be a man and all that but uh I wanted to I actually wanted to start by talking about this but I want to talk about it now because as we're diving into these conversations, here's my number one question for you. All right. So 2019, I got canceled. I had hundreds of thousands of strangers coming at me, threatening my mom to rape her and slit her throat and my girlfriend's getting messed. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and a lot of it was around these mental health conversations. So my number one question for you is where do you find like, I don't know, the courage, the motivation to talk about, you know, as your podcast is called the unspeakable, because it's been two years and I'm slowly getting back into it. So, so mm. how, how do you talk about these things and keep going? I have this conversation a lot with people. I think that, I think that, okay, it's a kind of multifactorial. I think that people who are kind of speaking out in this space, the kind of, um, the kind of, people in the, the heterodox space, whatever you want to call it, the, the liberals who are sort of pushing back against certain aspects of the left. I think that some of us have a, have a sort of temperament where we just don't care that much about social penalties. <laughs> there's a lot, because really what it is, is just, it's not that, um, it's, it's not that people, it's not that we don't know deep down that a lot of people or even most people agree with us and really want to hear what we're saying. Mm -hmm. It's that 
on the surface, it appears that we're being canceled and it appears that we're being piled on and it appears that everybody hates us when in fact, that's just like a kind of surface layer that you're seeing from, from Twitter. So mm -hmm. I think part of it is that I just have a personality where I don't really care. I care more about saying what I want to say mm -hmm. than about people liking me. And that's not to say I don't care about people liking me. I'm a normal person. Yeah. I don't like when people are mad at me. Um, but if I had to choose between the two, saying the truth is always going to win. Mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe to a pathological degree, you know, like this, yeah. you know, you could ask people I've <laughs> been in relationships with and maybe it doesn't work so great, you know, in, in, other, in other areas. But yeah. so I think that's one thing. But I think this is a huge point, Chris, I'm old, like I'm 51. So I started my career before, not just before there was social media, before there was internet. I mean, there were no internet comments when I yeah. started. So when I started my career as an essayist, writing provocative sorts of pieces, I mean, mm -hmm. I was able to write really long, thoughtful, extremely well edited pieces. Mm -hmm. I was able to work with actual editors and actual magazines and, and, you know, really think if I had a kind of interesting, strange idea, something that I wanted to convey about the world that I th thought would be something people wanted to hear, but was maybe controversial. I was able to do it in a really thoughtful and controlled way. I was mm -hmm. able to write a piece that would be in the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And if that would, and, and, you know, had all the kind of advantages that come from that fact checkers yeah. incredibly talented editors copywriters yeah somebody kicking my ass and making me rewrite it 14 yeah. times so i was able to do that but also people would read it mm -hmm. and then if they if they liked it they probably wouldn't say anything yeah there was a lot and of if, effort back then if you want right, to say and something. if they didn't like it they and if they really and, and if they didn't like it they also probably wouldn't say anything but if they really were determined to say something they would have to like get a piece of paper and write a letter to the editor and put yeah. it in an envelope and a stamp and put it and maybe it would appear in the letter section six weeks later and maybe i would see it and by that time i would be on to the next thing and i would <laughs> right. go on to the next thing because i had written an interesting piece and that was a good thing Mm -hmm. And even if it was controversial, an editor would say, hey, this person writes controversial, interesting pieces. I'm going to give her another assignment. Mm -hmm. And I would be on to the next thing. It wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. So I think I just was incredibly lucky to be the last, honestly, the last sort of cohort to be able to have a career mm -hmm. that um, was not sort of, sort of polluted with mm -hmm. internet noise. Yeah. And so I had that foundation. And I can just, I can tap back into that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's weird because, uh, you know, I, I could definitely just relate. Like when you, when you just, uh, you know, you write up just kind of like, uh, you know, your childhood and you grew up just like, Hey, you just deal with stuff and you get tough and you share like, uh, an experience like being on a subway and some, you know, dude who might've had mental illness saying stuff to you and, and you just kind of move on with your day and everything <laughs> like that. And, and yeah, like when I got sober, like the, the thing that saved my life was like this tough love, right? It was people like telling me like, Hey, you know, you gotta, you gotta get through this and stuff. And so I've seen that kind of shift and that's, you know, a lot of where the backlash for my mental health channel, cause I'm a very tough love type of person. And now I'm just like, Oh my God, just like stay and just do your own thing. But that's not really helping anybody you know right. what i mean uh you know in in uh the coddling of america of the american mind um from jonathan hyde and greg lukian off like i i keep thinking about it like i was thinking about it a lot rereading your book is you know no no therapist worth their salt would uh play into that kind of cognitive distortion like you know what you're right this is the worst thing to ever happen to you that that opinion piece that some reporter wrote or journalist wrote or you know it's so offensive that you should just play like nobody would say that you know what i mean and like we were talking about this a little bit before uh you know we started recording but uh, we were talking about uh, uh, a retraction about, you know, a, a review of Abigail Schreier's book, but have you noticed that with like publications, have you noticed a shift in like journalism where like, do you think journalists are afraid to take risks now? Or do you think editors are afraid to publish certain things because they know 
the backlash that might come from just having different ideas or maybe a controversial opinion? Like, how's that yeah. shifted throughout your time? Like, 500 percent it's it's not just journalists who are afraid it's editors who are afraid it's publishers that are who are afraid mm -hmm. um i find it heartbreaking to be honest with you mm -hmm. it's not the reason i got into this line of work you know yeah. it's the opposite and it's funny so this last book the one that we're talking about mostly today the problem with everything it it was considered extremely controversial. It got some extremely um, eviscerating reviews from places like the New Yorker, really? the New Republic, places that have you know embraced me. I was like you know the darling of these kinds of places for decades. Yeah, and um, I fully expected that kind of reception, mm -hmm. but it was still strange to see. And a lot of the reason it was so strange was because this book in, in many ways is the most anodyne of all of my books. It's the most careful. It's the most mm -hmm. constantly like, you know, it's, it's a self interrogation. So mm -hmm. uh, every sentence I'm like, I think, I think this is weird. I think this thing going on <laughs> in the culture is strange, but am I missing something? Am I crazy? Like a lot of it is, yeah. is trying to reflect on my own experience and look at where where my limitations are in terms of my perceptions and also look at maybe what these other generations are missing like this very phenomenon that i just described that i had this great gift of coming of age and a time before the internet i think mm -hmm. that's that is something that people of my age who like complain about the millennials and the youngsters we don't uh, factor that in we don't factor in the fact that they just don't have yeah that the range of experience they only have have the internet experience so mm -hmm. in a way like it's it's you know i want to complain about these people but i also want to say the reason i'm complaining might be a result of this thing that's not even their fault so mm -hmm. that's a, this is a very very careful book and frankly i've written books in the past that are much more kind of in your face um mm -hmm. blunt, much blunter um and they were totally lauded you know yeah. the critics love them the young people love them they got awards like you know yeah. these are wonderful essays this is important and here we are with like a totally different kind of response and so i find it um i find it disheartening and i'm mm -hmm. certainly not the only one i mean talk to any writer and this is this is all we talk about behind closed doors <laughs> yeah and so here's here's something that that I often wonder about. And I, I would love your opinion on it because I don't know if it's a false equivalence because like you said, like I try to see like, am I missing something? Am I just, you know, I read a lot of books on like uh, just thinking errors and biases and like all these other things, right? But so sometimes when I see like, uh, you know, younger millennials or Gen Z, they talk about how just because something was okay back then doesn't mean things are okay now. And they'll equate it to like, segregation and slavery and i'm like is that are you going too far is that like a bad equivalence like you know like so do you ever think about that like are times changing is it you know no longer culturally acceptable have we have we learned that you shouldn't talk about these subjects or you know like i i don't i don't know like what are your thoughts on on that well it depends on what it is i mean yeah. is it okay it's like there was a time when it was okay to be in blackface i mean there was mm. a time when minstrel shows were the main entertainment I don't yeah. think anybody would try to argue that it's a shame that that era is behind us. Yeah. Um, so obviously there's there's progress all the time, but I don't think that that uh, it, I, I think that this idea that we've never lived in a more racist time or a more <laughs> misogynist time or a more violent time, we we've never lived in a less racist, sexist, mm -hmm. uh, violent time in, in in western history i mean it's mm -hmm. never been a safer time for most people mm -hmm. it's and the idea that somehow it's the people anybody but a white man is in danger when they walk down the street is just utterly false it's a mm -hmm. complete fiction and somehow this fiction has become the the default setting for peoples and institutions and academia like it's it's become mm. their the premise of of an entire worldview and i keep mm -hmm. you know i i want to say to people like you know yeah there's things about 
this day and age that are not so great, but like, would you rather live in 2021 or 1921? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, I yeah. I said this before, like, I, I really like, you know, the clothes of the flapper era. I would love <laughs> to wear those dresses, but I would also not like to have to have medical treatment at that time or. Oh yeah. You know, like, yeah. You know, psychiatric like, treatment for women back then. Like, or mm -mm. like have surgery without anesthesia probably, or yeah. know that I might very well die in childbirth. And mm -hmm. most men know that they're going to die in war. I mean, up until very, very recently, life has been really hard for just about everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very easy to lose sight of that. Yeah, it, it's it's crazy too. Like I remember just when I think about that stuff, I remember being a kid and like, you know, throwing a fit and my dad would be like, oh, they're starving kids in Africa. I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't mean my life doesn't suck right now. You know what I mean? But uh, I, because whenever I'm having these conversations, I try to think of like, what would the most like extreme person on the other end be thinking of this? And and the argument you often hear is, yes, things used to be bad, but that doesn't mean we, we need to, we, we can stop like, making progress and and again like i think like this time the second read through of the book i was thinking about how difficult it is for like people like us who are like these liberals who like try to have this like nuanced conversation like i'm sure you get accused of being like some trump loving like <laughs> ma like yeah. rape apologist you know type of person and what like what do you think that is like just with like how has liberalism changed how is like the has right. like the left moved out further on the spectrum like or like is there a new part that didn't exist before i, I think i think the left and the right have moved farther out on the spectrum mm. i don't get accused of being a trump supporter i think that <laughs> would be a, a bridge too far but i certainly get i have heard people say uh oh you're like alt right now which is absurd yeah. absurd um, but, you know, I, I suspect that conservatives also feel this way about the conservative project. They're, mm. They have been hijacked by the ext extreme noises of Fox News and, mm. you know, ex extreme, just, just you know, the extreme right wing has kind of eclipsed old fashioned conservatism mm. the same way that the far left has eclipsed old fashioned liberalism. Mm -hmm. but the difference is that the left has won the culture. I mean, you know, we can complain about what goes on in, in Washington, you know, in terms of policy, but the fact is that the culture wars have been won by the left. They were won by the left a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, but now there are these, you know, this kind of this kind of progressivism, which is such a misnomer. I mean, it's regressivism yeah. and you know, it's, it's illiberalism. Um, that has kind of, that, that is now setting the tone for so many of our, of our institutions of, you know, what we see on television and what we read in books and what's mm -hmm. in the New York times and on NPR. Um, so I just, I, I, and it's very curious to me, I think there's a lot of reasons why this is, and I'm sure you have your thoughts about them. Having read the coddling of the American mind, people mm -hmm. point to a lot of the same things, but yeah, I think that there are there are generations growing up who view liberalism as a distinct thing from progressivism, and they see liberalism as a kind of just um, capitalist force and yeah. a way to maintain the status quo and keep the people in power who have always been in power there. And that's, to me, um, just a very simplistic kind of analysis yeah and and that's that's interesting like I, I always try to remember that like when I look because I try to be the most critical of you know my side because I want to stay out of like the bubble sure. and the biases you and care. Everything. also you care about yeah. about that side right it's like who yeah. cares what the other side is doing yeah it's it's difficult too because as I mentioned earlier I had a friend who's like moving away from like you know feminist movements because of all the inner fighting and everything like that and uh, I recently wrote like an in-depth review of uh uh, Robin uh, D'Angelo's new book and I'm sitting there I'm just like you're not you're not bringing people together like people are afraid to get involved in these things because of all the the infighting you know but but then on the right side too you see like when like uh, Mike Pence was like nah I don't think I'm gonna say it was election fraud and they're like oh well maybe we should hang you you know <laughs> so like if you're not as extreme as us so so I, I wonder like is that is that the the future like do if you had to break it down into percents, like, do you think there's more like on the on the 
far sides or in the middle. And lastly, I'll say real quick, because I, I think about the conversation I had with Chris Bale from the Duke Polarization Lab. And he said that just most people who are further towards the middle and not on the extremes just don't speak up that much. So like, what do you, what do you think? What do you see? Like, is it this gigantic problem? It's, are they growing in numbers or is it? No, I don't know, I, not as much. Most people are in the middle. The people yeah. on the extremes just happen to be loud. They have time on their hands to think about all these things that make them on the extreme. And then mm. they sit around on the internet and shout about it all day. I think it's really lopsided. I, I think that, you know, Harvard and Yale and, and NPR and any given corporation whose HR department is bringing in diversity and equity inclusion training in a panicked sort of way, those people, those people are in the middle, but they have decided to be held hostage by this very small and, and loud minority. Mm -hmm. um, and that I, I feel like we're sort of fighting with a ghost. Like that's, that's what I find frustrating. Mm. Now, there are people who disagree with me on this. They say, no, you're actually under, under, underplaying this. There are generations coming up, the young millennials and Gen Z, who have been um, educated in such a way that they truly believe that the United States is a white supremacy, that we have to completely dismantle the system. And that is their life's work. And they think, you know, they think that people like us are just ideological enemies and mm. need to be either, uh, you know, fought back or they're just waiting for us to, to die out. So, so some people will say that there are actually more of these people than, than I think, but I don't know. I, I, think, I think once those people get a little older, they'll, they'll see. I, I, I think the other thing is like, you get older and you see that life has complications. Like not everybody is, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very easy when you're 20 to, to um, assume that, that uh, men must, you know, must by definition be more abusive in relationships than women because men are stronger. Well, you know, wait till you've been in a couple of relationships, wait till you've met people who have all kinds of messy stuff mm -hmm. in their lives and you start to see a much bigger picture. You know, someone yeah. pointed out to me recently, there's a reason that so many life coaches are like in their twenties. <laughs> those are the only people that think that they know enough about life to tell somebody else what to do. I, I found that amazing because it's yeah, that so is true. that is that is really interesting. Uh, yeah, because I I remember that and and uh, I I've even noticed just in the past few years since my whole situation you know, in 2019, like, I feel like I've had to grow and I've had to see the complications. Like, that's when I started just devouring books. Like, something happened to me, kind of like, you know, you noticed there was this change. I'm like, what the hell is going on, right? And the first, the first subject that I really dove into was crowd psychology and this kind of group mentality. And so when we're talking, when we're talking about kind of the subject of like, who's on the fringes, who's towards the middle and stuff like that, like something that I question is how many people don't agree with the loudest voices, but they're just then signaling like, hey, don't come after me, I'm with you, right? So for example, for example, when my shit went down in 2019, look, I'm getting all flustered, um, but uh, in 2019, I had people come out and try to defend me, right? They're like, no, I know Chris, he's a good guy. And that's what I learned about you, like reading your book. I'm like, oh, she like helped out kids when she was younger, <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, I thought you, I did that, right? That's the only defense I have. Yeah, yeah. like you've, you've, you've done so much. Yeah, like, so why, why do you think like people will not defend their friends, will not have their back? And do you think people are just speaking up to join, like, hey, I don't want to get attacked. I don't want to be accused of being a witch. So I'll just, you know, yeah. point the finger at them. Like, how, how have you seen crowd psychology play, especially in the age of uh, social media? Well, you probably know more about crowd psychology specifically than I do if you've been reading about it a lot. But mm -hmm. no, I think we see that people have jobs and people have mortgages to pay and kids to put through college and rent to pay and food to put on the table. And if you're mm. working somewhere where speaking up or even defending somebody will put you in the hot seat, you're not gonna take that risk. And again, it's so frustrating because I think that most of these places, the, the, the people in charge, the people at the top 
all think this is nonsense. You mm -hmm. can't get to be the CEO of a company or somebody with a lot of power and not be resilient by nature and mm -hmm. not see that this kind of mentality won't get you very far. There's a reason that people with this mentality feel that they have no power. And it's because they actually don't have as much power as the people that they're, that they're punching up to. But the people in charge, I would think, you know, I'm sure there are some exceptions, but I think that probably fundamentally they are not gonna be inclined to this kind of wokeism or, or whatever you wanna call it. Mm -hmm. um, identitarianism, I like to think of it as. So, but for some reason, those people at the top haven't yet stepped up and said like, enough, this is nonsense, stop. So they send a signal downstream and everybody who works for that company or teaches at that university or whatever it is, is just mm -hmm. scared into, into silence. And, yeah. and there is, it's like, we're gonna, you know, if, so, and it's also easy for the people at the top to say, well, I'm gonna fire this person that will cover our ass. And then mm -hmm. we, we can proceed. I mean, it is, it's just, it's really like a circular firing squad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and speaking of like executives and stuff like that, there's so much talk about power dynamics lately. And I come from the YouTube world and stuff like that. And uh, something that I've noticed and, and we'll, we'll jump into like some of the stuff you talked about in the book. So, so like when I look back at being a kid and like people who wanted to be rock stars or movie stars and stuff like that, like I looked at a lot of them, I'm like, oh, you want to like get laid and be famous, you know, and stuff, right? And a lot of them are hooking up with like fans and everything. And now, now like a lot of it, you know, in the U in the YouTube space, if, if a creator ever hooks up with a fan and they, you know, and then that goes south or whatever, they're like, oh, there was a, a power imbalance, you know, there was, a, a, so he took advantage of her and all this stuff. So I'm like, all right, so like, is there, is there like now this rule where you can only, you know, seek out people on your level, but you talk about it in the book too. And, and there's this spectrum, right? Like you have the, the Harvey Weinsteins, right? And then, and then you mentioned like the Aziz and sorry thing. And it seems like people make it so black and white and there's no in between. Like you mentioned, like, like, you know, you had a lot of weird dates you know, and sometimes you were using your power as a woman to, you know, like have power over like the guy that you went out to lunch with and stuff. So like, why, why do you think that's happening when we're incapable of seeing this spectrum of situations? Yeah, power is one of these buzz concepts that's come out of this kind of, again, I hate to use the word ideology, but I guess I just will. <laughs> it's, you know, it comes out of, actually very useful concepts like intersectionality on its face is really uh -huh. useful. That came out of, that's a legal theory. It was coined by Kim, Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a law professor. And that was looking at the way that power differentials intersect within certain workplaces. And in this uh -huh. case, it was in the context of a lawsuit of, against General Motors for workplace discrimination. So, you know, it's, in that context, concepts like intersectionality are, are useful. But the problem is that they've been um, sort of misapplied and just you know stretched into meaninglessness. And so what happens from that is that people sort of sort of seize on words or ideas like power, 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 yeah. power. And if they want to make their point, like you know, instead of you know, it, it frustrates me because there's a lot of these kind of you know feminist writers and people out there who are extremely beloved and write for the big magazines and you know who I once was fairly much you know, fairly in alignment with. And I think we're still pretty much in alignment, but we get put in this position where we have to have a debate or something. And the person will always say, well, this is about power. And you're not recognizing that at the end of the day, <laughs> white men have all the power. And it's like, that's not untrue. It's not totally untrue, but it's yeah. not also the whole truth. Like power is, power is fluid. Power is mm. shifting all the time back and forth between people. Like you can be in an interaction and that person has power one minute and you have power the other minute. Now that's a different way of talking about power than some of these other people are talking about it and doesn't mean that the other way of talking about it isn't valid. But I just feel like, you know, to just kind of fall back on the idea of power, it's just kind of like talking about late capitalism over and over again. Like it mm -hmm. just doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's 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 interesting. Like uh, I think that's interesting that you touched on that. Like power is like fluid. Like if we think about it, like 
you know, uh, just like right now, right? Like I'm a white dude, right? And you're you're a woman, and and like right right now, I would perceive like, oh, Meg is a pretty successful author to live in, you know, the good life and stuff. I would perceive you as having more power than me, but you bring someone else in the room, right? Like a bajillion, like tossing Elon Musk or something weird or Jeff Bezos. I happen to have Elon Musk right here, you know. <laughs> and he would have, he would have more power than you, right? Yeah. So it's constantly shifting and changing. And like, I'm sitting there, I'm just, uh, you know, like thinking about how like, it, it's so difficult for people to see, like, don't you see how power is constantly changing? Like you talk about the rise of the Me Too movement and what was her name? Is it Asia Argento? Right. Um, yeah. Where she, you know, she was part of the founders, but then the story came out about her allegedly hooking up with that young boy, yes. right? So she was taken advantage of by, you know, quote unquote power, but then she used her power. And, and then the conversation of grooming keeps coming up over and over and over as part of the power dynamic. And that's a weird, weird, tricky topic. But what are your thoughts on, on that? Like, I, I find it weird that there's like this magical age, like 18, now you just know everything. You can go off to war, you can consent. Um, but then if you go to Europe, like 16, I can get drunk, you know, like there's like these this, these weird arbitrary things about like age. And, but when I think about like, obviously pedophilia is terrible, but what do you think about like the grooming and that power dynamic? And, and is there an age where you shouldn't be hooking up with younger or older people or? I mean, I, uh, gosh, yeah, it is funny. Like, wait, it's like, it's so arbitrary. Like if you're 18, if you're 17, you can't do anything. Yeah. The next day you're 18, oh, you can do anything. Yep. You can go to prison. For, you yeah, know, you just, can yeah. Yeah. You go to sleep and just wake up and just you're right. a new person. Right. Uh, I mean, it's, the thing is, it's so complicated, but it's also so interesting. Like the idea of grooming, I guess, you know, we associate that with pedophiles grooming mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. but then there are situations i mean was harvey weinstein gr weinstein grooming these actresses i mean mm -hmm. i you know obviously you know he he's such an obvious example for one thing for one thing because he's disgusting he's like physically repellent <laughs> very easy it's very easy to cite him as an example because there's nobody who's going to defend him you know, mm -hmm. there's like, he's, it's very, very simple. It's a very clean shot to talk about Harvey Weinstein, yeah. right? Um, but I think the only thing that makes it like slightly, slightly more complicated is the fact that, you know, these actresses, they wanted something from him. They, mm. they were adults. They knew what they were doing. They, they knew that there was this kind of, this, is, this has been around in Hollywood since the beginning of Hollywood. Um, the, that doesn't make it a good thing. And that doesn't mean we should accept it, but it is there mm -hmm. and everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that it's, I just think that we need to talk about it. And then again, like a yeah. nuanced way. And I don't know enough about like, I don't really care enough about Harvey Weinstein and like the, the various accusers to say, well, like this one had a relationship with him. And so therefore, yeah power is this and in this case he clearly you know assaulted somebody so it's this i don't really know the, the details enough yeah. but I, you know yeah. it's like something like yeah it's just you know you know what i think is this is okay i'll just say this put you know, it out there i, I hate <laughs> I, I i hated i hate milo yiannopoulos and never found him funny yeah i thought him extremely uninteresting um and I, I couldn't believe he, you know, didn't get canceled, you know, before. I, I find it amazing that the thing that finally brought him down was over the most interesting thing he ever said. <laughs> yeah. He was making a very nuanced point. He was talking about the distinction between pedophilia and pederasty, basically. And he was talking about how, you know, he was talking about how as a gay man, involvement with older men is sort of part of the coming of age for a certain generation of gay men that he as mm -hmm. a teenager i mean i might be slightly misremembering this but i think this was the basic gist that he as a teenager as a gay teenager was involved with older men and that this was 
part of how you kind of find yourself as a, as a gay man. Like it mm -hmm. has historically been that way. And it was much more that way in the past because people were not out as much. Like there weren't like, there was a community of, of you know, age appropriate other gay boys to get to know. Yeah. So, you know, there was this phenomenon. And then he made a joke about priests and how he was so grateful to father whoever for, you know, helping him come into his own. And obviously that's incredibly tasteless, but yeah. I actually was like, oh, like that's actually an interesting thing to think about. And it was like, oh, no, sorry, no yeah, more. No that more, no that more. crossed the line out of everything else <laughs> he like, did. Okay, but you know, he was can't he had to be canceled by by the right. I mean, the thing is, mm. you can only be canceled by your own side. You can only be canceled by your own peers. If you are canceled by your enemy, that actually just adds to your cause. Uh, that's a good point. So, yeah. so Milo was canceled by you know, the left a million times, and all that did was increase his power. Mm -hmm. But the, the, you know, the bridge too far was this joke about priests and this joke about pedophilia. Yeah. And, you know, even the, the right the, the right wing can't stand that. It's like, oh, no, no, we're, we're done. Like, th that's it with you. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I found that kind of so anyway, to get to your to get any thoughts that I have about grooming um, I, that that particular scenario comes to mind. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's interesting. like I'm sitting here and as, as I'm thinking about this and the stuff I want to chat about, I'm like, oh, my God, talking to Megan's it's going to get me canceled again. Uh, I, I think about like and I, I wonder if you've noticed this, too, is this kind of like lack of personal responsibility, right? Like you talk about like the Hollywood industry and people knowing what they're doing and like, oh, maybe I'll sleep with this person and maybe I'll get this gig or da, 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 right? And so just like real quick, like about me, like my my entire life, I blamed everybody. I, I blamed my alcoholic mom. I blamed not having that much money. That's why I was depressed and anxious. That's why I turned to drugs and alcohol, da, 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 da. And finally, I was dying from my addiction at 27 years old and my son was only three. And they're like, listen, if you want to live, you need to quit blaming the fucking world for your problems. And I was like, damn, it was harsh. But I was like, you're right. I need to take responsibility. I'm a big boy now. I need to take responsibility. And it's crazy because my son is 12 years old. And since he was like five, six, seven years old, I've, I've taught him like, you make a decision. Here's the consequence. You know, like you and, and you learn from that. You grow from that. But like when we're talking about power dynamics and and grooming and and just like uh, I, I hate to use the word because that can get you in trouble. It's like victim mentality. Do you think there's been like a larger uh, issue with like this lack of personal responsibility? Like like I I want to empower people. Like look at the shit you can do if you stop letting other people affect you so much, right? So. How do you see that in, in the world today of like victim mentality versus empowerment and, and all that? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to talk about this without saying things that are obvious kind of. Um, and so like the obvious thing would be that for various reasons, there's become currency in, in being a victim. Like, mm. you, know, you know, John McWhorter makes this point that- Just finished his book. What's that? I just finished one of his books. It was my first yeah, book for them. He's got a lot it. of books. Yeah. You know, he makes this point about the Jesse Smollett thing. Like, remember that? So the mm -hmm. actor, Jesse Smollett, the actor who um, he was, I, I guess he was about to, he didn't like the terms of his contract. He was on yeah. Empire. So whatever. He was kind of like his star was falling, at least in his own mind or something. And so he, he ginned up this hate crime. He basically staged a hate crime against himself. Mm -hmm. um, and it spectacularly backfired, but you know there was a moment there where everybody was like rallying around him and like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this is you know it's so obvious that a, a black man in this you know this very hip neighborhood in Chicago would be attacked by a noose and in, in a Dunkin' Donut like you know just, yeah. I mean, I, I the minute I heard that, I I smelled bullshit on that. Yeah, I was like, this is a little weird. I didn't, I didn't say anything, um, but you know, McWhorter's point is you know, victim, being a victim has now so much currency that a, a television star, a Hollywood celebrity would actually choose that route in mm. order to, to elevate himself. That yeah. he's seeking power through victimization. And so that's a remarkable kind of, um, kind of turn of events. You know, it used to be that you saw power, you showed your power by, 
should, never being a victim. And that's yeah. not yeah. great either, right? Because that's kind of denying reality and and you know not having a lot of empathy for others and you know so so i think there's a middle ground here but mm -hmm. yeah i so again i don't know exactly why this came about i think it's probably a combination of the stuff that height talks about in coddling of the american mind there was a change in parenting styles um i think that the the movement the anti-bullying movement had mm -hmm. a lot to do with this it's kind of an unintended consequence of a very well-meaning and otherwise, you know, important movement. I mean, when we were, well, when I was growing up anyway, like there was always like, you know, there were always kids who were being beaten up by certain other kids and everyone just kind of accepted it as a, as a fact of life, as an unfortunate reality. And, you yeah. know, um, there wasn't, it wasn't like if the, if the teacher was walking by, they would do nothing sometimes i would actually but um it was just you know schoolyard insensitivities were just part of being a kid mm -hmm. and so i think this anti-bullying movement came along and really was like no this is unacceptable like this has been going on too long and this absolutely cannot happen mm -hmm. and so that i think an awareness of that kind of overcorrected, and yeah. it made it so that like you know, people are unable to distinguish the, the damage done, you know, the difference between the damage done of somebody beating you up physically in the schoolyard and somebody's just saying something slightly lame or, you know, tone deaf to you yeah. in, in the hallway. Like those two things became sort of the same. Yeah, there's no more spectrum. The, right, yeah. and so you don't have just an ability to to laugh something off. I think people have lost their sense of humor. I mean, the, the way to really disarm any situation is to laugh at it. The way to humiliate your opponent is to laugh at, at them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that technique seems to have been completely lost. Yeah. I, I, I uh, now that the pandemic's over, I finally went back to uh, a 12 step meeting for the, like in person for the first time the other day. And, uh, and like, I was like, oh my God, I forgot what it's like for people to just laugh at themselves and just, you know, like, like we, you know, we've been through some terrible shit, like people laughing about like selling their body for dope and stuff like that, you know? And right. I'm just like, this, this is a group of some tough mofos and these are my people. Like, I, I love it. And, uh, and yeah, like, and you're talking about schoolyard bullying, like my, my son, uh, you know, he's had, he's had, you know, his little run-ins and stuff like that, but I can't imagine him coming home and me being like, oh, you poor thing. I can't believe you got bullied. You little weakling, you're terrible and you have no power at all. Like, you know what? I mean like why why would we play into that and that's why I, I appreciate people like yourself who who talk about these things and you know I was trying to do that and I'm trying to get back into it of like empowering people like listen you could bounce back from it because it builds this resilience right like the shit that you've been through the shit that I've been through it's like made us stronger now we can look back and say oh I can get through other things right yeah I just think that the the effect of social media is that it takes what would otherwise just be a blip in time, a little moment in your day, and it allows you mm. to amplify it and turn it into like a political moment. You yeah. know, like, it, you, you know, it used to be just that somebody would say something to you and then maybe you were offended or whatever and you would complain about it with your friend and then you would forget about it. But instead yeah. of complaining about it with your friend, you go online and write some screed about it and then everyone goes, oh, you go, girl, or like, oh, that's not <laughs> or like, this is what I mean, you know, so, you know, just, you know, yeah. it turns in, literally every single thing is, is a, a molehill turned into a mountain. To, yeah. Know, yeah. And, you know, uh, there's so much, you know, about it, like, we're, you know, just even on Twitter, just retweeting, and this is offensive, and this and this, and breaking it down, and I try to be respectful of, you know, people's feelings and stuff, but I'm most like, really, is this the worst thing that's happened to you, you know, in your life, and uh, I've, I've been really interested in the whole idea of free speech lately, right, like, I remember in your, in your book, you were talking about the rise of the inner intellectual dark web, and I could, I could really relate to that, because you talked about how, like, you know, the Jordan Petersons and Sam Harris's and Weinstein, every, everybody like that, uh, like they could say shit that you disagreed with, but yeah. you were like, hey, but they're sharing their ideas, you know? Right. So I guess my first question to you, like, do you think there's anybody that shouldn't 
have a platform or a voice like like is there a is there a line or do you think everything should be fair game um wow i've actually never had to answer that question before boom i did it well done sir (laughs) um i mean off the top of my head i guess if somebody is well i mean look a free speech absolutist would be somebody i guess unless you know you can't you shouldn't cry fire in a in, in a you know in a, theater, in a crowded theater right? yeah in a crowded theater okay so i guess if you are actively doing harm if you are if you are uh spreading information that is has is going to directly physically threaten people uh-huh. uh then maybe that should be not allowed. But I don't even know what that would be, to be honest with you. Yeah, because like, for example, like if you just said, oh, I'm gonna kill you, you know what I mean? Or like, oh, I wanna beat your ass. Like, should that not be allowed? And you know, that's something I think about a lot. Like, I think here's a great recent example. Like, what are your thoughts on Donald Trump being ta- uh, deplatformed? Because there's this plausible diabil- uh, deniability where he was like, oh, we need to go in there and fight. And it's like, well, did you say go storm the Capitol and fight or like, you know, like come together and like fight as a movement, you know, like was he, in your opinion, right? Like, uh, was he inciting? Was, should he not have a platform because think, of his power? No, I, th- I think it's worrisome that he doesn't have a platform because God knows what he's doing and <laughs> right, in the shadows. And, and he's like a, like a cult hero now, which is potentially more dangerous than, you know, seeing his buffoonery paraded in front of us every day. I mean, I don't miss him. I like that we're not hearing about him all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know I, I, I find it uh, really, really problematic. Sorry to use that word. Uh, <laughs> that it's just been arbitrarily decided that that he can't speak. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem is, is that if you're going to let everybody speak, you need to trust people to filter out the good from the bad. I mean, this is the thing, like we, our notions of free speech have really, they've been um, kind of codified before the age of the internet where everybody was speaking. I mean, like there was a kind of mechanism, you know, you could, you could mm-hmm. write something, you know, completely irresponsible on a piece of paper and distribute it to people walking by, mm-hmm. but that's not the same. I mean, you know, we, we would have systems in place to kind of there, there would be quality control because you know you can you can say anything you want but you can't say anything you want in a newspaper mm-hmm. an editor of a newspaper is going to say no we're not going to allow you to say this because that's our decision as this as this private entity mm-hmm. so there's all kinds of systems in place to kind of filter out there have been all sorts of systems in place to filter out misinformation and mm-hmm. stuff that really should not be said So you take those away and then, yeah, there is a conversation about free speech that is really complicated. Yeah. But but the thing is now it's just arbitrary. Like YouTube is deciding that we can't talk about, you know, COVID therapies because something, I, you know, that's just like, so the algorithm is deciding this or what? I don't know. Yeah, no, it, 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 (laughs) it is their algorithms. Like I, I had a video debunking COVID conspiracy theories taken down by the algorithm. And it took a lot of media t- attention just to get it back up, right? And and I get it and I try to empathize with them because I realize how much content's being uploaded and Twitter just started birdwatch where it's kind of like the community fact checking. And and where, where it gets weird, it's, it's like, cause uh, you know, I've had people who come on and like debunk conspiracies and stuff like that, like, there are people who believe insane things, Megan, like crazy things, right? Um, so, so it's like, how how much trust do we put in people to take information and then make the smart decision? And that's where that's where I find the difficult conversation because it's like, can we trust people to be people? Because people are easily manipulated, taken advantage right, of. Right. Yeah. Right. So and what people you- want it, they there's so much confirmation bias. Mm-hmm. They'll take in what they want to hear. Mm-hmm. So I think that we have to sort of like look at the bigger picture here, like take a long view. I think media literacy needs to be a huge part of education curriculum. Mm-hmm. I think 
kids, I, I think learning to read along with that should come learning to sort out what is true and what's not true. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this piece needs to be really re rethought, not just rethought, but thought out. Like we need to completely take what take the media climate that we have now and start from scratch and say, how do we help the next generations wire their brains in such a way that they can sort through this? Mm -hmm. Because I think it's a little bit, it's a little late for us. Yeah. So, so do you think just like this current generation is like screwed and we got to hope for the, the next one? I mean, you know, I think this, you know, there's, there's smart people who do get it. Um, but there are all, you know, there have always been people that believe mm. in nonsense. Always. Yeah. It's just that we didn't see them as much. Like we didn't see them talking about it on Facebook. We didn't, mm -hmm. you know, they were sort of there and, but we just, we just weren't as aware of it. You know, yeah. I think that's the other thing is like the world has always been screwed up and crazy right. and horrible things have happened and, and, you know, injustices have always happened, but we just didn't see every single one, mm -hmm. you know, like now if an unarmed black man is shot by the police, we will hear about that. Mm -hmm. every single one and but it was happening before and it was happening worse and yeah. more often before it was yeah. it was it was exponentially more prevalent in the past mm -hmm. but it feels like it's never been worse because if it happened 10 times in a given year we heard about all 10 of those things yeah and it might have happened 50 times 20 years ago and we heard about it not at all mm -hmm. so it's yeah so how how have you seen like I, I remember you you discussing in the problem with everything like uh the issue with like virtue signaling and I've been really interested in like signaling right like that's that's an interesting thing and like we were just saying like these things have always been happening but now that they're getting more of a a, a spotlight on social media it feels like people have to signal and say hey I don't like this either right which is not necessarily bad, but uh, there's things like, you know, uh, I heard uh, the term slacktivism, where people just talk, like, you get involved, like, I, I've seen you write about, like, getting involved in, like, different events and raising money and helping out different organizations and stuff like that. Do you think that, like, a lot of people... Like, that's nice with you, and that's your perception. I'm not an activist. I'm not. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm a passive, I'm a pacifist, passive. but yeah. with, like, a, yes, with an, two S's. Yeah, yeah. but do, do you think that a lot of people are just not doing, like, not even passive, you know, like, like, even passively doing stuff? Do you think a lot of people are just signaling, like, look at me, I care about these things, or do you think more people are being, becoming aware and getting in, involved Yeah, in I mean, way? I... I'm wary of just saying, oh, people are so cynical and they're just like saying Black Lives Matter just, you know, <laughs> for something as a fashion statement. I mean, there is some of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think people are genuinely upset about the way the world is and they want to feel like they're doing something about it and they're mm. upset in their lives. I think that also like what's happened is everything has become politicized, obviously, but that includes people's personal problems. So, you know, one thing about Trump was that he came in and he kind of like had this effect where whatever your personal problem was, like if your relationship was on the rocks or, you know, you were having professional crisis or, you know, you, you couldn't afford something like whatever it was, if you were, if you were distressed, if you were depressed, if you were clinically depressed, if you're dealing with trauma, whatever it was, yeah. he, he made it so that it was about him. Like <laughs> right. people who had like they were they had they were dealing with trauma issues that were totally their own thing that had to do with their upbringings or their parents or something in their lives and suddenly it was like I'm traumatized by Donald Trump. Yeah. And it's like don't give him all that credit. <laughs> Why are you doing that? It's yeah. not about him. Like it's he's not that important. He's not that powerful. Don't give him yeah. that power. Yeah, And so I think that like what I see is people have various things going on in their lives that cause them pain and they they funnel it into this political expression and then do the sort of virtue signaling, whatever you want to call it, as a way of kind of having that be part of the, the package of their their self-identification mm. as a person who is 
working through various problems. And so yeah. it's just, it's all muddled, you know? Yeah, and, and I, I'll tell you this, something that drives me nuts is, as, a, as a, you know, mental health person and who's made a lot of mental health content, I see so much talk about mental health and the words traumatized being thrown around in depression, but like the amount of p people willing to go to therapy is, insanely low right they want to you know so really? they're, is that true yeah i don't know oh, yeah yeah no and a lot of people because like you you talked about it's very true um you know even working when i was working in treatment like I, like nobody wakes up in the morning is like hey i want to be a heroin addict a lot of it's coming from like traumatic childhoods and you know and all these other things right but but then it kind of it goes out into these other places and you know uh politics and these like social discussions and i'm just sitting here like you guys go to therapy now trust me i know therapy can be expensive but a lot a lot of us like we'd rather go out there and uh talk about trauma and depression and anxiety and i'm like why don't why don't why aren't you seeking help for this you know what i mean you know what's so interesting though hmm. i have heard that a lot of therapists are captured by this ideology what do you so, mean so like a lot of so people who go through social work school people who become uh people who become therapists who become um is it yes clinical social workers that work with people is that what it is yeah, yeah like so the the identitarianism the wokeism ideology is hugely present in social work schools in psychiatric institutions so you have a lot of therapists who are encouraging th these sorts of connections like yeah. really a lot really really a lot and so i find it I, i'm actually fascinated by this because i do think um that there's like you know, my pinned tweet on Twitter is Twitter is where personality disorders become careers. Like there's, yeah. there's a lot of mental illness. And I know that's a broad term hap mm -hmm. happening on social media. Yeah. And the, the more you display it, the, the more kind of, you know, you, you get elevated. So yeah, the idea that people won't go to therapy though, that's really interesting because like, is it because they think that it's not necessary because they can kind of just work it out online or they don't yeah. want to pay for it. Or, <laughs> well, if you ever want to have a difficult nuanced conversation about just mental health in that, that space, like, let me know. Cause we can have a whole another conversation, but, uh, uh, yeah, like I, I, I was, I was just listening to your awesome podcast right before this, and and we were talking about like gender affirming therapists and and playing into this rather than looking for any possible other factors. But I have great news for you, Megan. My girlfriend is actually in her master's program for social work, and and she she's not one of those people, but she does talk to me about students in her class. Or you know, uh, fortunately, it seems like uh, her professors don't really play into that but that's good that's yeah. good but okay. like but you know then you got to hope that the professors outweigh what the 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 young people are learning in everyday life and on the college campus and you know what i mean because even professors are kind of being silenced but but no i think your pen tweet is perfect because uh <laughs> you know my cancellation was kind of because of that there were people who who were being put on a pedestal because of their mental illness because of personality disorders and and i'm like wait why are we glorifying this rather than seeking help for ourselves to have you know better lives and i know people like the drama of like you know celebrity breakups and everything like that but it's like hey what if this person was a better role model by going and saying hey i'm getting help because I keep getting into abusive relationship after abusive relationship. You guys are all seeing it and I'm influencing you. So, so like I said, I could talk about- But it's so much thing. easier to blame the patriarchy. It's so much easier to blame the patriarchy for your serial abusive relationships, right? Yeah. Like, no, you know. like remember I was, I was saying when I got sober, like, like I was dating, I dated toxic woman after toxic woman. I, I, I dated women who hit me, threw shit at me, tore up my room and stuff. And that was just normal for me, right? And then I was like, wait, 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 wait. Maybe if I stop seeking out crazy women, maybe crazy shit will stop happening. I took that personal responsibility, but like you said, it's easier to just blame the patriarchy because it sucks to have to look at yourself. And I, I love that about you know your writing is that you get really introspective with that. Is that, I only got a little bit more of your time, but is that, let's talk about your writing. Is that difficult or is that challenging? Do you like doing that? Or, you know, you get really vulnerable and open and talk, I'm like, dang girl. So. It's, it's so funny. Like I uh, always feel like with this kind of writing, you want the you. I mean, I teach writing. I teach the, I teach personal essay and memoir. And so I always say like you want the reader to feel like they know everything about this narrator 
but not mm. necessarily anything about the author. You know, that there's a real, mm. there's a real difference. There. And I think that I'm, I'm able to be uh, honest on the page because I'm ultimately controlling it. I'm, I'm writing it. Like I've chosen what to include. Like, you know, I think I say in the unspeakable, you know, for every, for every detail that seems incredibly vulnerable, there are 10 things I decided not to say, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's a little bit of an, of an illusion, but um, I guess, you know, to, to my mind, there's no point in writing unless you're going to communicate something with the, with the reader. I mean, why, why bother otherwise? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I also, you know, I want, you know, I, I don't, I'm really wary. I don't like this idea of confessional writing. I think mm. like, you know, I was, I was writing about my own experience starting in the nineties when everything was like confession. There's all these like women confessional writers. And yeah. I hated that genre. I didn't want to do it. I was, I made a very big point of saying like, I'm not writing memoir. I'm writing personal essay. It's yeah. an essay. And you know, <clears throat> the lines are pretty blurry there, but I think that, you know, I, I want to um, talk about this stuff in a way that is intellectually honest and sort of rigorous mm -hmm. and not sloppy and all over the place and actually has been thought through. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of people kind of giving a bad name to, to honesty actually, mm -hmm. because they're doing it, they, they're confusing it with just like, blabbing all over the page or just like mm -hmm. saying whatever they want you know it's kind yeah. of like you know just asking questions like just there, there's just asking questions has now been weaponized right? <laughs> yeah so like uh with well, my last question for you like is it ever difficult for you because I think you do a good job with it not being a confessional but there's introspection I see in your writing like you'll even question some of your thoughts and ideas and but you know rehashing like you know in the unspeakable which I you know only recently read you talk about the passing of your mother and you know some other difficult experiences in your life do you ever have to like just take a break because you're like going in and like looking at this <laughs> stuff um, yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I wrote a thing recently about how I, I'm not going to write about myself anymore for a while. I think that, um, yeah, I think that, uh, especially as you get older, I don't find that my life is that interesting anymore. Like, I think <laughs> when you're younger, there's a kind of, um, I, I think I called it like, there's a sort of endearing cluelessness that you have as a younger person that kind of mm. translates in a more charming way on the page. And because part of writing about yourself is that you're you're sending yourself up all the time. You know, you're making fun of yourself. You're kind of a raconteur. And so mm -hmm. I think that I, I haven't yet figured out quite how to do that as an older person, uh, as an older woman, particularly. And also we're in this moment where, I'm sorry, like if you're a white chick and you're writing about your experience, that is not going to be received very well. Mm -hmm. Like there's always this privilege that, you know, you're always like, well, that's so privileged of you to be, you know, mm -hmm. complaining yeah. about this thing that you had so I so I want to I, I I'm still trying to like figure out how to how to finesse that but yeah if, do I get tired of writing about myself yeah which is which is why I started writing about um the culture wars and now I'm really tired of that so yeah yeah it gets exhausting too something new <laughs> so so one of my last questions and I, I even have it in bold on my notes so I want everybody to go get your book the unspeakable like I binge that and uh you taught you share a story about Joni Mitchell and your fortunate event of, of meeting her and, and the tragedy of how that story ended. But, but, <laughs> not, a <huge> <laughs> not a huge tragedy. But I felt, like nobody was injured. No, nobody anything. died. No, no physical harm. But, but this is my Joni Mitchell moment because I love your writing so much. And I, I know you do workshops, but for right now, for me, for me mainly, and if anybody listening also likes to write, like what, what's like probably your number one, because you're such a good writer, Megan. What's your number one? If you could only, if you only had one minute to just give me some writing advice, what's like the best advice for writing? Oh, um, I would say, uh, talk to your reader. You want to tell your story. Don't, I think people emphasize showing a lot. It's always like show, don't tell. This comes from fiction workshops. It comes from screenwriting, obviously. Yeah. But when you're writing first person narrative nonfiction, you want to have this idea that you're, you're, you're telling your story, mm. um, that you're talking to your reader. So it's, it's really about, about intimacy. Like mm. you want your reader to, to feel that you're, you're sitting across from them at a, at a table and like sort of leaning in and, and telling yeah. them something. You know, you're not confessing, but you're confiding. 
Mm. And that's the mode you want to lock into. So little sub question real quick. Uh, so do you kind of think about that? Like while you're writing, are you just like, if I'm talking, like, do you kind of envision just I'm writing to one person? Like, it's not like this huge audience. It's like, I'm just having a conversation with one person and telling them my thoughts, my ideas. Cause like, you know, the unspeakable is more personal than there's the, uh, the new one, the problem with everything. And it's more like, and it, so like, do you just like, I'm having a conversation or I'm telling you my story. Like, how do you kind of picture it as you write? Yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, I guess I, I picture, I, do I picture one person? I mean, I, I, I picture like some group of people that I have faith in that they will understand what I'm saying, that they will, that they will get me. I mean, that's the other thing is you really have to have faith in your reader that they're going to be able to metabolize what you're doing. And, and that's not everybody. Some people are going to hate it. You know, <laughs> yeah. you've, got, you've got to write knowing that some people are going to hate it because if you try to appease those people, it's going to be, it's going to be nothing. Like the other That's thing, I've been is, with. Like, you know, you know, nobody would, you know, nobody will love you unless somebody hates you mm. by definition. Yeah. So go for broke, you know, they're yeah. going to hate you. If they don't hate you, if, if nobody hates you, you probably haven't done anything. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're being too, you're getting too comfortable, you know? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's something that I, I keep trying to be mindful of. It's I keep thinking like, oh, am I going to piss this person off or this person off or this person off? But it's like having faith in that. Specific problem, at this audience. point, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Like, that's their problem. If yeah. they're pissed off, I feel exactly. I love it. Yeah. I love it, Megan. So, so you, you, you've got a lot going on. So I want everybody who is just now being introduced to you, like, can you tell us like what you going on? You got going on about the podcast, you working on anything else? And where could people find you? Okay, well, um, I, I have a podcast. It's called The Unspeakable Podcast. It doesn't have anything directly to do with my book, The Unspeakable, but I was trying to think of a, a name for the podcast. Uh, you know, it's it's yet another interview show where I have long, nuanced conversations. Yeah. People really can't get enough of them. I have to say, I, I'm not, I don't feel too bad about like putting another one in the, out there. Um, it's it's going great. It's, it's uh, I've had people like John McWhorter. I've mm -hmm. had... Um, Helen Pluckrose. I, I just, you know, we talk about all sorts of things. Um, uh, I ha I've done a number of, not a number, I've done a handful of um, podcasts about some of these gender issues. Mm -hmm. I had Katie Herzog on a, a couple of times. Um, I started it last summer. It's, it's every week. Um, and really what I want to do is, is not talk about cancel culture in it in and of itself, but in fact, just like be part of the culture. Like mm. talk about the things, you know, we're complaining that like, oh, we, we can't talk about these things because, you know, we're being shut down. And like, let's move past that and like actually just talk about them. But, but also talk about them in, in the right way. Because I think part of the problem is like a lot of, we're afraid to talk about these things because they often get discussed irresponsibly and kind mm. of like by the wrong people. Mm -hmm. So I really, I make a big point of trying to find exactly the right person to talk about the thing. Like I had somebody come and talk about the sex offender, the sex offender registry Ooh. and why we need to get rid of it and why it's not effective. And like, that's the kind of topic that I'll, I'll have, um, you know, just the, the kinds of things that you just never thought about. Um, yeah. and so, so we do that and it's been great. It's, it's really fun. And the, uh, the, the 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 official logo is is nuanced AF. There's a uh, there's a there's a merch line, so you can get your um your nuanced yeah. AF mug. There's all kinds of items. I think the nuance has just become such a joke that uh, you know. I just thought it would be a funny. Yeah, I was I was just looking for it. I I, I replied to your tweet when you, you shared something about it because I, I went to your personal website. I'm like, what? I was like, did I imagine this? I thought you. Oh, it's not right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you can find so the show this the show has its own website and that is theunspeakablepodcast.com and the nuanced store mm -hmm. is in, on the show website. Uh, but you can also get the podcast all the regular places. You can subscribe, and um, yeah, it's going. It's it's going really well. It's gonna. I'm gonna move it to um, to a an, a platform, in a, a, another platform in a couple of weeks here, pretty soon. But nothing's Ooh. gonna change. Yeah, more on that later. But um, 
yeah, it's 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 really fun. So yeah. I'm always open to guest suggestions and um, awesome. Yeah, I'll 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 be sure to link that down in the description and you tweet out you know the new episodes and some conversations and all that stuff. But yeah, Megan, thank you so so much for your time and having this nuanced conversation with me. I appreciate it. You're welcome, Chris. It was really fun. Thanks for thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. All right, everybody, that was my conversation with Megan Dom. So yeah, do yourself a favor, head down to the description below, make sure you are following Megan over on Twitter, check out her books, I will link those down there as well. But also, as uh, Megan and I discussed in this episode, she has been really focusing on her podcast lately, and I, I only recently got into it after reading her books and she brings on such interesting people and has these really great conversations about topics and and I I, I really enjoy them. They're so, so beneficial and help us get different points of view and everything like that on stuff that's going on in the world so we can have a little bit clearer mind as we discuss these things. All right, so make sure you check all that down below and thanks again to Megan for coming on. But yeah, before I let you go, don't forget, make sure you're following me over on Instagram and Twitter at The Rewired Soul. Again, there is a video version of this episode uh, up on the YouTube channel, The Rewired Soul, youtube.com slash The Rewired Soul. So you can see me and Megan's beautiful faces as we talk. There's a few other episodes, but I, I also have a bunch of other ones that I've recorded that will be up soon with video. So make sure you're subscribed over on YouTube. All right. And what really helps out the podcast is if you are following it over on Spotify or Apple. And if it's over on Apple, take two seconds, just two seconds. We got 24 hours in a day. Just take two seconds, leave a rating and review it. All right. That really helps a lot. And I don't want you to, you know, leave some, you know, random review and just say things you don't mean like leave an honest review. That's cool by me. I love the feedback. All right. But it helps the algorithm and it puts the podcast out in front of more people when there's ratings and reviews and subscribers. But the other thing you could do, and it's totally free. That's the great thing. You can share it with other people over on social media, all right? So if you like this conversation or any other conversation, make sure you're sharing it with friends, family, whoever, all right? But for those of you who do ask and would like to support the podcast in any way, there are some links down below. You can become a Patreon. I have written uh, a few books myself, some on mental health, addiction recovery. I even wrote a book on my experience being canceled back in 2019. All that stuff helps support the channel. And if you're someone like me who wants to improve your mental health, there is an affiliate link down below for BetterHelp Online Therapy. It's a service that I've personally used. It's great, it's easy. You work with a licensed therapist, it's fantastic. So check out that affiliate link down below if you're interested, all right? So thanks. Thanks so much for listening to this episode. Make sure you're following me over on Twitter and Instagram because I have a lot of cool things coming up, a lot of cool episodes with some great people. So yeah, it's really, really exciting. I'm so glad that this has been going so well and all of you for supporting the podcast, all right? So anyways, anyways, I hope you all enjoyed this conversation with Megan Dom and I will see you next time with a brand new author. Thanks. Thanks.